Hey, good morning, everybody. This is, we ended up last time just talking about piecewise defined functions. Let's look at a couple of those examples. After we do that, that's the end of section one. Then we'll start section two. And there we'll talk about the, the algebra functions as well as the difference quotient. If we have time, we'll start section three, which deals with composite functions. Because then after that, we only have two sections left and the chapter is done. So we're going to finish chapter two next week for sure. Okay, example of piecewise defined function. Graph this function. That's not working. X plus four when x is less than equal to 2 and 3 minus x when x is greater than 2. Graph that. All right, does anybody remember how we do this? Yeah, we start with, there are two separate functions here. The first one is g of x equals x plus four. When do we use that function? Yeah, less than or equal to two. You need to know this in order to start your graph, uh, your table, so you do your graph. It also helps to know what kind of function is it. X plus four, what kind of graph is that going to be? It's linear. Yeah, very good. It's positive linear, so it's an increasing function. So what, what x do we start off with? Yeah, start off with two. Always start off with the uh, number in question in your inequality, in your domain. It says x is less than 2, so it's 2, 1, 0. For lines, all you need are two points to draw a, line, a graph. So I'd, I'd like to put three just for good practice. So when x is 2, what's y? What's that? 2 plus 4 is 6. When x is 1, when x is 0, 4. So we'll label my graph here. So when x is 2, I go to, I go to 6. Open or close circle? Close, because it's equal to 2. Then when 1 is 5, when x is, x is 1, y is 5. When x is 0, y is 4. And there's our graph. It goes on this forever. And what do we know about the second function? It's a what kind of graph? What kind of graph is that one going to be? It's linear. How do we know it's linear? Right, no special operations, no exponents, no radicals. It's X is not below the dividing line. So it's a straight line. Negative in front of it, so it goes which direction, up or down? 
down. So it's a negative slope. We use this equation whenever x is greater than 2. So we'll make a little table. What number? What x do we start off with? No, start off with 2. It's just that we know it. Always start off with where that ends. We know that at this point, what's going to be in the graph? Open or closed circle? Open. So if, if x is 2, 3 minus 2 is 1. So at 2, 1, we put an open circle. Because it's not included. x is greater than 2. So what's greater than 2? 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. 4. 3 minus 4 is negative 1. So there's that graph. And it goes on forever. Remember, when you create these tables to find your points, remember, these are points. This is 2 comma 1. This is 3 comma 0. This is 4 comma negative 1. These are, when you make this table, you just created the points of your graph. How about this function? We can't avoid fractions. negative 5 over 6 x plus 1 when x is less than 6 and negative 4 when x is greater than or equal to 6 And if you notice, look at our domain. This this part here, the x part, is our domain. You notice that it's always continuous. x is less than 6, but not including 6. But this next one starts off at 6 and is greater than 6. So everything has to be discussed. So we draw our graph. So this first function, it's used whenever x is less than 6. So when we create our table, what's our first x we're going to put in there? Always start off with the endpoint. If x is 6, what's y? Negative 5 over 6 times 6 plus 1. The 6 is cancel, so we have negative 5 plus 1 equals negative 4. Two, four, six. Negative two, negative four, negative six. So at x is six, y is negative four. 
open or close circle? Open, because we cannot use six. Is it a graph, increasing graph or a decreasing graph? It's what? Decreasing, because the coefficient of x, the slope is negative. So we know the graph has to be going downwards. Now the next point, which x are you going to choose to make it easier for us to calculate? Well, if you use a three, six and three cancel, you'll still have a two on the bottom. Then you have, you have to fix all that. Always, when you, whenever you, you have a chance to make up your own mind of what you're going to pick, may, pick it so the bottom number disappears. But what's the easiest X to use? Remember, it has to be less than six. Any one of these numbers. Zero. If you can, use zero. Because negative 5 over 6 times 0 is 0, leaving us with just 1. So we know the y-intercept is 1. And since we know it's a linear equation, those are all the points we have to do. All we need are two points to, to draw a graph. And the next point I would use would be negative 6. negative 6 and 6 cancel negative 5 times negative 1 is 5 plus 1 is 6 so at 6 it'd be 6 so that's the first graph the second graph is used or your second function is used whenever x is bigger than or equal to 6 Again, this is another linear equation. It's a straight line. But what is this? What does this graph going to look like? It's a horizontal line. No matter what x you give me, has to be. So we start at six, seven, eight. No matter what x you give me, what's y going to be? Negative four. It's always going to be negative four. It's a constant equation. So at six, it's negative four. Oh, they overlap there, so it's a solid dot now. And it goes on forever. All right, let's do one more piecewise, then we'll move on to section two. F of X equals negative two X minus 12 when X is less than negative 4. It's 1 when x is between negative 4 and 1. And x plus 7 when x is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, once you graph that, I mean, yeah, once you graph that, I want you to find these values.
make your chart. Let's go ahead and draw the graph. Create your little table thingies. Negative four, negative five, negative six. And this next one. So at negative four. Zero and one. One, two, three. So when X is negative four, what's Y? Neg yeah, negative 4 times negative 2 is positive 8. Minus 12 is 12 minus 8 is negative 4. Negative 5 times negative 2 is positive 10. Minus 12 is a negative 2. Negative 6 times negative 2 is positive 12. 12 minus 12 is 0. So at negative 4, it's... So at negative 4, negative 4, is it open or closed? It's open, because we can't use that 4. At negative 5, it's 2. At 6, it's 0. So we know our graph will look like this. It's a decreasing function. And the next one, f of x equals 1. So no matter what I put for x, the y is equal to 1. It's a constant horizontal function. So at negative 4, it's 1. Solid dot. At 0, it's 1. At 1, it's an open dot at 1. Don't just copy what I put on the board. I mean, I'm asking y'all to do this first by yourselves before I put it on the board. I'm, mine is just a check. Because if you're just copying mine, it's not going to do you any good. When you go home, try to do yourself, you won't know what to do. When x is 1, 
1 plus 7 is 8. 1x is 2. 2 plus 7 is 9 and 10. So since we can use 1 at 1, it's 8. It's a solid dot. 2 is 9. 3 is 10. There's the graph. So I'm going to do the same thing we did last week, remember? I'm going to have some questions. I'm going to have you come up here and do it on the board. So you learn how to do it. Now, all we did was graph it here. Now we still have to answer the questions f of negative 6, f of negative 1, f of 1, f of 2. So go ahead and work those out. So when f of negative 6, which function do we use? The first one, because x is negative 6. Negative 6 is less than negative 4. So negative 6 times negative 2 is 12. 12 minus 12 is 0. And the next one, f of negative 1. X is negative 1. Which one does it fit into? Is negative 1 less than negative 4? No. Is negative 1 between negative 4 and 1? Yes. So our answer there is 1. This is the X. These are the Y's. Again, if you don't understand that, this is the type of stuff you should be asking me instead of just staring and copying. If I lose it, yes. Ah, very good. If it has a line underneath it, at that point, that is a closed circle. If it's strictly an inequality, that's an open. So, at negative 4, there's no line. So, at negative 4, it's an open circle. At negative 4 here, on this graph, it's a closed circle. At 1, it's open. And one on this function is closed. You notice how at the endpoints they always overlap. Only one of them could be included. So you look for that line underneath it. So this was included here. This was included there. A very good question. What about f of one? Anybody in the front row? What would this answer be? Ah, I see what you're doing. But in this one, X is one, right? Is one included here or is one included here? The bottom one. So we have to plug in one right there. One plus seven is eight. <laughs> that, was, that was a good guess. Th that went with the earlier question is if it's open or closed, if it's included or not included. That's why whatever is inside here is, is two less than negative four? No. Is two between negative four and one? No. So a 2 has to be here. It has to be bigger than 1. So a 2 plus 7 is 9. That's how those work. All right. Now section 2. The algebra of functions.
Now, when they say algebra of functions, it's just a fancy way of saying this. Okay, we have two functions, f of x and g of x. That could be anything. When we talk about the algebra of functions, we can add them together. We can subtract them. We can multiply them. And we can divide them. And the bottom one has a stipulation is g of x cannot equal zero. So when they talk about algebra, all they talk about is multiply, add, subtract, multiply, divide. That's all they talk about. Now there's another way, there's an equal sign. Instead of doing it this way, we can have it like this, with f plus g inside their own parentheses of x. So this is its first function. Here's the variable. Here's the second. So we subtract the functions and then do x. So what's the difference between these two? Both sides of the equal sign. What's the difference? Hopefully this example will show it. Find f plus g of 3. There. Given these two functions, find f plus g of 3. So it's asking us f plus g of 3. Up above, we can rewrite it. f plus g of x. We can write it this way. So we can put f of 3 plus g of 3. Whenever you see a formula that has an equal sign, you can use either side of that formula. Let's see what this means. On the left side, what it's saying here is combine the two functions first before you put the x value in there. Remember, this is a function. So f is 2x plus 3, plus g is x minus 5, and our variable is 3. This is still a function, this of 3. So combine like terms, 2x plus x is 3x. 3 minus 5 is negative 2 of 3. Remember, this is still your x value. So now, anywhere I see an x, I put a 3 in its place.
3 times 3 is 9, minus 2 is 7. So that's what this side says. Combine the functions first, and then put in your x value. This side just does the opposite. This one says f of 3. So I go to this function. Anywhere I see an x, I put a 3. There's that plus. Same thing with a g. Here's a g function. Anywhere I see an x there, I put a 3. Two times three is six plus three plus three minus five is negative two. But these are both done independent of each other. Six plus three is nine. Positive and negative is a negative. Nine minus two is seven. So this side here tells you find the values of the functions and then add the two values together. You either add the functions together, then take the x, or find the actual values of the functions and add the answers together. Which side looks easier? Yeah, this side here looks much easier. Again, you can use whatever method you want to. Let me find some more values here. Because these are the coming out of the homework assignments. That's why I have these written down. All right. f of x equals x minus 2. g of x equals x squared minus x. Find f plus g of 4. Remember, you can choose any method you choose you want same thing as f of 4 plus g of 4. Now, if you, unless you finish, don't look at the board. Unless you finish, don't bother looking at the board.
So what'd y'all get? Very good. Or you could do on this side. Plus 16 minus 4. Yeah, so the right side's obviously much faster and safer because the equations are smaller. F of x equals x squared minus 6. G of x equals 6 minus x. Find f minus g of negative 10. Finish, spit out your answer. Did anybody bother doing the left side, or is everybody doing the right side? <laughs> yeah, because this is how ugly it would look on the left side. You have the first function minus. Whenever you have a minus sign, whatever is behind it, put in parentheses. What would happen if you didn't put parentheses around that g of x? If you didn't put, so you had g of x would be. 6 minus x. And here's the f of x. Look at this. Look at this. What's different? I changed the value of 6, but not of x. So whenever you have a minus sign, whatever, you, whatever goes after it, always put in parentheses. Then distribute. Because then it would be x squared minus 6 distribute that minus 6 plus x yeah so everything in the parentheses changes signs so it's x squared minus or plus x minus 12 at negative 10 negative 10 squared plus negative 10 minus 12. Negative 10 squared is 100. Positive and negative is a minus. Minus 12. 100 minus 10 is 90. 
90 minus 12 is 78. Let's see this side. Negative 10 squared is 100 minus 6. Negative and negative becomes positive. So it's 6 plus 10. 100 minus 6 is 94. 6 plus 10 is 16. 94 minus 16, 78. So far, so good? So, yeah, you pick either side. Only make sure you come up with the right answer. Is if you have negative signs in the equation, make sure you put parentheses around the variable afterwards or the function afterwards. This is question three. F of x equals x squared minus three. G of x is 3x plus 5. Find g minus f of 3. I'll get that. Do you want me to do the left side? See how that would work, or everybody okay? Right, let's do it real quick. So g of x is 3x plus 5 minus whatever comes afterwards, I put in parentheses, x squared minus 3 at the value of 3. You can't forget the, and it's not multiplied. This is the f of x type thing. So get rid of the parentheses inside there. Change the signs of everybody inside the parentheses. So that this negative distributes to both of those. Combine like terms, so it's negative x squared plus 3x plus 8 so negative 3 squared plus 3 times 3 plus 8 I just I put the 3 in place of X this is negative 9 plus 9 plus 8 those cancel 
So 8 equals 8. Remember, there's a difference between these two statements. This one is negative 9. This one is positive 9. Because the exponent only affects what it's connected to. That negative is not connected to that. Here it is. It's negative 3 times negative 3. So be very careful about that. h of x equals x plus 3. g of x equals square root of x minus 9. Find h minus g of 0. It's funny. Everybody, I can tell when everybody gets to the second part. Because <laughs> everybody's they're writing real quick. I'll just put that in there and stare at it. The h of 0 is pretty easy. So it's 0 plus 3. That equals 3. The problem comes on this side. Square root of 0 minus 9. 0 minus 9 is negative 9. So what's the square root of negative 9? Does not exist. Why not? Because what times what? It has to be the same number when you multiply it equals negative 9. Negative 3 times negative 3 is a positive 9. So also, remember the graph we had of the square root. The graph of the square root looks like this. You cannot have negatives inside square roots. So this answer, since one of them doesn't work, the whole thing doesn't work. There's no answer, no solution. Which, let's now talk about the domain of these. When you talk about the domain of functions, you look at the domain of the individual pieces, and then you look at the domain of the combined equation. So what's the domain of h of x, of this one? What's the domain? Well, can x be negative? Yeah, I could put negative 5 in there. Can x be 0? Yeah, can it be positive. So it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. It's everything. It's all real numbers. How about g of x? What is my domain of g of x? Again, this is the reason, one of the reasons I want you to memorize those charts, the functions and the graphs. Because if you had the graph, you can tell me automatically the domain of the square root function is 0 to infinity. So the smallest this number can be is 0. 
So x minus 9 equals 0. Solve for x. x equals 9. That's the smallest x can be. So we can still use this function. Anything smaller than 9, what happens? If I put 8 in there, 8 minus 9 is negative 1. That's not good. If I put 0, 0 minus 9, that's not good. So it has to be 9 or above. So the domain of g of x is always the opposite of what's inside there. So if it was x plus 9, the answer would be x equals negative 9. So it would be from negative 9 to infinity. It's always the opposite of what's inside there. So the domain of your final answer is where they overlap. So the domain of this one is 9 to infinity. So the domain of the question. So basically it's this. The domain of your combined function is the domain of the most restrictive function. Since this was negative to infinity, positive, I, this was 9 to infinity, I have to use this one. Now, look at the value, what I'm looking for, at zero. Is zero in the domain? No. So, because if I knew this first, I could see that that's not in the domain, so I, there's no solution. All right. So that's when we deal with domains or functions in general. Number five, h of x equals x plus one and g of x equals square root of x minus two. Find g divided by h of 2. So what's the answer? Sure. Yes. <laughs> A no zero. So yeah, so this, the top can equal zero. The bottom can never equal zero. We always have a restriction. H of x cannot equal zero because it's on the bottom. And since it's not equal zero, if the top is zero, it's zero. All right, let's... G 
plus h of 7. Just by looking at this, can you tell me what the domain is? Yep. It's always the opposite of this to infinity. So since the, the x value is, is in that domain, I can use it. Everybody that? So yeah, so if you you don't have to write all this stuff. If you, if you, if you could see what it is, just put the answer down. Okay, doc. The difference quotient. Difference simply means x2 minus x1. It's the, it's the difference. It's subtraction of two numbers. Quotient means fraction. So basically, a difference quotient is a fraction that has a difference problem. Well, we've seen that before. In this equation... There is the first difference quotient that we did. What is that? The slope equation. The difference quotient will find us the slope. But more so, it's called the average rate of change. average rate of change. This difference quotient is a lot more powerful because this equation only works if we have what? If we have two points and a straight line connecting them. We have x1, y1, x2, y2. That only works in straight lines, but what if we had a curve? What if we have a curve? Are we finding the slope of the curve? If we took two points? No. We're finding the slope of the line. We're finding the slope of what's called the secant line. The secant line is a line that crosses a graph at two points. The secant line is a line that crosses a graph at two points. One, So, to find the slope of a curve, we need a difference quotient. Let's see how this is derived. We have two points on a curve. 
this is x1, this is x2, this is y1, and this is y2. So everything looks the same, but we're not getting anywhere with that. So let's first define the distance between x1 and x2. We'll call that h. <laughs> The bigger the H is, the wider they are apart. The smaller H is, the more narrow, they, the closer they are. So let's say, for example, if X1 was 3 and H was 5, what is X2? Eight. Because if we started here at this point and I went five units, I ended at eight. So x2, to get to this value, I start at x1, and I add whatever h value I have. So that's how the second point's defined. I pick a distance between them, and that tells me where they end. We know where they begin at x1. Once you give me h, I'll tell you where it ends. OK, over here. We have f of x1, and this is f of x2. Not new there, but we, we redefined x2 as being this equation. So f of x1 plus h. What's beautiful about this is how many points do I need? All I need now is x1, y1. I really need just the x1 value. Once I have x1, I can find y1. Once I have H, x1 and I have the distance, I can find x2, which means I can find y2. Let's see how this works. The slope is this. The slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We've done that all along. Yeah. x2 minus x1. But now these functions x, y2 is f of x2, y1 is f of x1. What is x2 equal? Yeah, x2 equals x1 plus h. minus x1 same up here inside the function x2 is x1 plus h minus f of x1 Notice the only x we have is x1. Because of that, we don't have to put the subscript anymore. But let's fix the bottom. x1 plus h minus x1. What happens on the bottom? x1's cancel. So all we have left on the bottom is h. On top, we have x plus h minus f of x. That is the difference quotient.
So that, again, the difference quotient finds the slope of a curve at a given point. So from this equation to this graph, can we find the slope of the curve at any one point? The only way we can do that is if h becomes what? Right now they're this far apart. We got two different points here. How do we get the slope of only one point? How big is h at this point when x1 and x2 are equal? Anybody guess? Well, look here. If x1 and x2 are equal, then h disappears. The only way x1 and, and x2 can be equal is if h is 0. When that happens, we have the slope of a curve at one point. We call that the tangent line. The secant touches at two points. The tangent only touches at one point. And you know what the slope of the tangent line is? That equation right there. The slope of the tangent line is this one right here. When h gets infinitely close to zero, when it disappears. Let's see what that means. Because of the time, we'll, we'll do one example, and then we'll continue for next week. Here's the example. f of x equals 3x plus 2. Use the difference quotient to find the rate of change. So that's the question. Use the difference quotient. Whenever you have a problem like that, the first thing you have to write down is what is the difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x all <coughs> over h remember h is any number we pick we have f of x well, what do we get f of x plus h then that is what we have to create So anywhere we see an x, we put an x plus h. Anywhere we see an x, you put an x plus h. Because we have to have both parts of the top number. Find f of x plus h by placing a x plus h in place of x. Put x plus h in place of x, which is all we did. That x became x plus h. That x became x plus h. Now we have all the pieces. What is f of x plus h? 
x plus h plus 2. That's f of x plus h. Minus, what's f of x? 3x plus 2. But it comes after a minus, so I put a parenthesis around it. Everybody follow me so far? Did I lose anybody? So we first had to create x plus h. So basically anywhere in the equation you see an x, put x plus h in its place. In the parentheses, in the equation, anywhere. Now, f of x plus h is what that is. That goes in the first spot. Minus, there's the minus sign. Whatever comes after it goes in parentheses. Now we solve, or simplify. We have to get rid of the parentheses. Distribute. 3 times x is 3x. 3 times h is 3h. <coughs> plus 2. Here's that minus sign. But that minus sign goes inside that parenthesis. That minus sign in front changes the sign of everybody inside there. So the negative times a positive is a negative, 3x. Negative times a positive is a minus 2. Whenever you get rid of parentheses, always combine like terms. 3x and negative 3x cancel. 2 and negative 2 cancel. All we're left with is 3h over h. The h's cancel. So we have the rate of change. It's a linear equation. We knew whatever's in front of the x, we knew there had to be the slope. But we just learned how to use the equation. Here's another hint. Anything after you get, distribute the, the negative sign here, everything after the negative sign has to cancel out. Has to cancel with something out in front. This minus f of x, after you distribute it, Everything back here has to cancel. If not, you did something wrong. All right, we'll stop here. Yeah, we had, I had another three or four examples I want to show you. Oh, well, we'll do it next time. So that's what the average rate of the difference quotient is all about. Any questions? All right. Have a great, safe weekend. And try to do your test for Chapter 1. Because we're going to finish Chapter 2 next week. We're almost done with it, actually. This is the, this is the, next, the easy, next hard part. The hardest part is the transformation. Which where you have to memorize the graphs. Okay, have a good weekend, everybody. I want to thank you all, those of you who pitched in and uh, 